Good to see you, everyone. My name is Robbie Howell. I am a game designer, history enthusiast, and lover of Age of Empires 2. And today we're going to be doing something a little different from usual. As of now, I have created an awful lot of Age of Empires related theory crafting videos, 11 to be specific. And I thought it would be pretty fun today to go back through all of them and take a look at what changes I would make after having read all of your excellent comments and just having a slightly better sense of what I'm doing now that I've done so many of them. So today we're gonna to be doing my first ever Theory Recraft, where as mentioned, we take a look at my first 11 builds, all of them, uh, and see what changes I would make to them with hindsight being 2020. I figure this could be a fun kind of semi-regular thing to do. I must say, and I'm sure every YouTuber says this at some point in their career, probably the single best part about doing YouTube is reading all of your fantastic comments. I'm incredibly lucky to have an awful lot of very engaging and intelligent people in my comment sections who have so many cool things to say about history and Age of Empires and game design more broadly, and I would love to hear more from you in that regard. Uh, also of note, every single one of the updates that I have made here has been updated on the various Civ documents. Links to all of them, Civ and Unit, I should say, links to all of them down in the description below. The original versions of all of their different sheets will be on the second page of the documents in question, with the recraft being on the first page. With all that being said, let's jump into my first ever theorycraft build, that being the Georgians. I'm not really sure why I started with the Georgians, but this was just the first one that came to mind, kind of one that I thought would be an obvious fit for the game. Like just, oh, this is so perfect. How do they not already have this? Uh, big thanks to commenters, including Fergus Shan and Safawan Fauzi and many, many others for the input that led to me making many of these changes. So let's go through the changes I made and why. To start with, uh, the Georgian's feudal monk bonus, the kind of flagship bonus of the civilization, which lets them construct a monastery in feudal age, but limited total monks built to one and made so that they couldn't pick up relics. Well, I removed the one maximum and now they have limited range, automatically going back up to nine range once you hit castle age. I thought this might allow the bonus to be a little more powerful and dynamic while still requiring a lot of opportunity costs because monks are still very, very expensive and you still can't pick up relics. A general trend I noticed when I was revisiting the Georgians is that they are quite underpowered. So a lot of these changes are buffs. Uh, second of all, they have a new bonus. Their forage bushes last 100% longer. So similar to the Mayans, but much bigger and only for forage. Um, the Georgians did not have a single true economy bonus. Yeah, their feudal monks could be used to convert villagers, but how often does that really come up in like a practical sense, especially when you have to waddle that little dude all the way across the map. So this was an attempt to give them a an eco bonus of some kind that wasn't very good. Like this forage bush thing will help kind of smooth out probably your like dark to feudal age transition or like let you stall farms a little longer, but it really shouldn't be that powerful um, while still being enough to make them feel like they have an eco bonus of some kind. And it is of course in reference to the fact that Georgian wine uh, was famous at the time and still is rather famous today. And the best parallel we really have for that is forage. Uh, moving on, I have better defined and slightly adjusted their unique unit, the Tadzreli. Uh, this now more closely resembles kind of a, a weaker boyar, rather than being kind of the uncanny valley between a, a boyar and a knight that it was before. Um, the relic bonus that it gets is, is still applies, so when it's near to a relic it gets substantially stronger. Moving on, uh, their unique technology, Imperial Age unique technology, Hymns of Repentance, now gives conversion resistance on top of everything else it already did. A commenter said, wow, the Georgians should really get conversion resistance. And I said, wow, you're right. Uh, and this was the best place to put it. Moving on again, they now receive Heavy Cavalry Archer. There were Cuman tribes moving through Georgia constantly during this era. And lastly, they receive crop rotation because as mentioned, the Georgian wine was famous and their late game eco was really garbo. So this was kind of a way of giving them another little eco push. And I believe that is all, oh no, that isn't all. I also gave them a proper likelyometer score, which I put at nine out of 10. I think they are shoe in for the game and are very likely to be added at some point in the future. All that being said, Let's move on to my next civilization. This would be my fourth ever build, the Mosse. Um, I was quite pleased with this one as well, and I took some risks with, and not all of them really paid off. Uh, huge thanks to Riaz Agahi, Mustafa Hizal, and Johannes Eilson 
and many others, of course, for all the input on this particular build. You may notice that there are going to be some repeating names on these thanks sections because I have, again, some fantastic commenters who consistently gave me brilliant ideas that I made a lot of use of. Jumping into what I changed about the Mose, uh, first of all, a lot of people mentioned that one of their Civ bonuses, that being that husbandry benefited them doubly, was definitely too strong. And so it now gives them 50% more benefit, which means that after husbandry, they are tied with Cumans for the fastest cavalry in the game. Now, the difference is that the Mose get this benefit in Castle Age, but it costs a little food. The Cumans get it in Imperial Age for free. So just a little bit of striation. It might make it a little bit more generic, so I could see perhaps changing this one slightly. As always, if you have any suggestions on how I could alter some of these changes, please let me know down in the comments. If it hasn't been made clear already, I love reading your ideas. Moving on, their team bonus allows them to train scout line units at the town center starting in Feudal Age. And a couple people mentioned that the potential all-in nonsense that you could do with two stables in town center all churning out scouts in Feudal could be a little oppressive, and it's a team bonus. So this is now limited to two scouts before Castle Age. So once you've trained your two Feudal Age scouts, you cannot make any more, but once you hit Castle Age, you can train scouts, light cavalry when you upgrade them, etc., etc., just as normal. This should hopefully tone down that potential annoying all-in strategy that people were concerned about. Additionally, their unique unit, the Nakomse, which is a hybrid javelinier and melee cavalry, has just had its stats defined out, so if you want to see a little more of its exact in terms of its HP and armor and range and all that, I have all of those on the sheet in full now at this point. Lastly, uh, they now receive the Mangonel. Previously, the Mose did not have even the Mangonel, and so their siege workshop was very, very limited. Um, that felt a little too crippling and was maybe a little too drastic. So they do now get the Mango so that they can defend themselves a little bit in Castle Age versus some early crossbow pressure or similar. That's all the changes I have for the Mosaic. So let's move on to the next on our list, that being the Footman. This was my first unit build. It was definitely one of my most discussed builds at the time because there was a lot of very weird things going on with it. And I, I don't know how common unit theory crafts are in the broader AOE2 community, but I, I really enjoyed doing it, and I plan on doing plenty more of these in future, so I look forward to it. Uh, big thanks to Madness, Johannes Eilson, Tetrahedron, and others for their input on this particular design. In general, the Footman was a little bit underpowered and very overtuned in not very useful ways, so these changes are seeking to kind of streamline its position within the game and make it a little more practical from a AoE2 conventions standpoint. So let's see what I did. First of all, their cost has changed. They previously had a split cost of food, wood, and gold, but now it's just 40 food and 40 gold. Should make it nice and simple while being a distinct cost among the other units in the game and making them more gold intensive than other infantry units, but at the same time, no more resource intensive than a sword line unit. Along similar lines, I wanted to give them a little bit more of a clear niche within the barracks. What are they supposed to be good at? And to this end, I gave them one more attack, but they also now receive bonus damage from the sword line. So this plus one attack should hopefully make them a bit more of a threat, a bit less of just kind of a dirtily useless little dude. Uh, and the sword line bonus should make it more easy to counter them if your opponent is really massing them without having a more dynamic army composition and hopefully would give a bit of a buff to the sword line, which definitely wants to be a counter unit to more things. Perhaps not completely historically accurate, but feels intuitively correct and should make them a lot more interesting uh, to play and have counterplay against in-game. Uh, additionally, the footman now benefits from the supplies technology, reducing its cost by 15 food. Lastly, I've tweaked both of their specific unit upgrades, their castle and imperial age, their retainer and honor guard respectively. Both broadly have their costs reduced. This is going to be a recurring theme across the footman. A lot of their upgrades were way too expensive. That's something I very much underestimated in my early days of theory crafting. Early days. It was like freaking five months ago, but a lot can change in five months. Next, their unique technology Shield Wall is having a couple changes. Similarly, it's becoming a good deal cheaper and faster to research, which is another thing I used to consistently underestimate. But it is also receiving a more substantial balance change. It doesn't give you any speed boosts anymore. However, now when you're unmoving, you are immune to arrow or javelin fire. Um, this 
will make them a lot more threatening. It will take a lot of micro because this benefit only applies when they are standing still and should lead to some very interesting creeping advanced scenarios and force your opponent to spice up their armies with cavalry and infantry to counter your footmen creeping ever slowly onwards towards your archers. Um, might feel a little extreme. I'm actually fairly confident this would be balanced in practice because they're still absolutely stomped by siege. Uh, and other hard-hitting melee units will have zero problem with them. But I'd like to hear your take on whether you think this is too much. I, I think it would be pretty exciting, but that's just me. Uh, similarly, their other unique technology, Oaths of Loyalty, has a massive food cost and time reduction, uh, but it no longer reduces their gold cost. Now it just gives them regeneration, which should still be quite useful, quite powerful, uh, just not quite as warping to which civs have viable footmen and which don't anymore. At least that's the goal. Uh, I also gave them a full civilization availability grid like I did for the Arquebusier. I have kind of reformatted how these look on the sheets, so if you see them looking different, just know that that's entirely intentional. And lastly, I updated their likeliometer. I think they were at like three and a half or something. That was way too high. I think it's very unlikely that the Age of Empires 2 development team will be adding new barracks units. I wish they would, but I really doubt they will, and so uh, likeliometer is now at a two out of ten. That's a lot of changes, but it's not the thing that I have the most changes for. So uh, hold on to your horses. That one's coming in the not-too-distant future. But before then, let's get to another of my funkier civilizations, that being the Dutch. When I first started working on this theory crafting project, just in my own time before I started making YouTube videos out of it, the Dutch were the second civilization I made after the Georgians. I just waited a while to release them because I wanted to, well... Why did I do it? I think it's because other ideas just came to my mind that felt like they would be more interesting than the Dutch. Uh, and that kind of reflected in the fact that my Dutch build was very jank and had a lot of kind of cool but do nothing bonuses. And this balance, balance patch? <laughs> I guess this is a balance patch. is kind of geared towards addressing those. Um, as always, huge thanks to Crown and Zastar994 for your input, along with many, many others. The Dutch certainly needed the help. I would say that they were one of the most underpowered civs that I have built so far. Uh, now, to start with, the civilization is now classified as a levy and economy civilization rather than spearmen and economy. Now, if you're not familiar, a levy is the term for like a mass conscription of soldiers, usually pretty crummy civilian or peasant soldiers. And I think that using the term levy instead of the term we now have as trash could be a cool way to classify those units as well as classify civilizations that specialize with those units. You'll see the term levy pop up in my theory crafts in future, I am sure. Uh, additionally, the Dutch's first big change, their farm bonus has been completely retooled. Previously, it allowed you to partially build farms in water, which I think is really cool and very fitting, but it's just not strong. <laughs> and maybe if people thought it was particularly thematic, we could keep it on them as like a hidden thing, but I just don't think it has the oomph to be a proper civ bonus. So now, their civ bonus allows you to place farms irregularly as long as they retain at least a two by two core at their center. So what this means is say you have a, a little patch, like a little place on the ground that's been blocked off by a bunch of straggler trees. And so there's like a two by two square and like one tile here and one tile here. The Dutch can still place a farm there and it will take proportionately less wood but also have proportionally less food in it. So it's just a matter of letting you fit more farms down in weird oblong positions. I think this one actually has the potential to be an actually useful bonus that benefits agriculture while still being kind of funky and interesting. And I like the Dutch being offbeat and unusual in terms of how they play. Uh, next of all, the trade cart half population and spear spawn thing is gone completely. It, it just ended up being too funky to balance uh, and in combination with their unique technology that lets the trade cards shoot, it it felt like it could be absolutely terrifying while being very, very off-brand for what you're normally used to when playing the game. Uh, instead, they now have a plus one melee armor bonus benefiting their spear and skirm line per unit upgrade, which means that elite skirmishers will cap out as having one bonus melee armor, because it's only one upgrade, and halves will end up with plus two melee armor, because there's two upgrades, pikeman, halberd. Um, so it should naturally scale through the game, uh, and it should befit their new levy classification. I don't want them to just focus on spears anymore. I like it being both spears and a little bit of skirmishers in there too. 
Uh, their team bonus is also now weaker. It previously allowed them to train spearmen and spear line units much, much faster. So it's a little bit weaker, but now it's both spear and skirm units. And this applies to the Dutch and all their allies. It's no longer just a purely defensive bonus, which I think the spear one was. It now is a defensive bonus that also have maybe some offensive implications if you want to try a trash rush. Uh, next of all, their unique unit, the Burger, which is that uh, Godin Dog infantryman that doubles as a villager, and so it can go out and gather, but also can fight as a melee unit, and had like kind of spear slash sword line bonus damage hybridized. Um, I've redefined all of its stats, but I've also made a couple of balance changes. Uh, it now has retooled bonus damage such that it's pretty good against both cavalry and infantry, but not great against either of them. More notably, it now costs a little less gold and its attacks ignore armor. Now, the burger does not have fantastic damage. However, it will still allow the burger to kind of fill a role that neither your spears or your skirms will be good at, which is dealing with incredibly heavily armored enemy units, especially something like a champion or a powerful unique unit. Um, those are gonna be much more effectively dealt with by burgers and will kind of fill in one of the holes in the Dutch late game army. Second to lastly, I gave a little more detail to my proposed Burgundian replacement unique technology. Uh, this was the one that would replace the stupid and not very thematically compatible Flemish revolution, uh, which I proposed would be replaced entirely. This unique technology is called patronage. It's very cool. If you wanna see more details on it, check out the specific Dutch civilization document in the description down below, as mentioned previously. And lastly, I updated the Dutch's likeliometer to a seven out of 10. I still think that they are above average in terms of their likeliness as a, a candidate for an addition in a, a later expansion, but I don't think they're quite, I think it was a nine out of 10, the nine out of 10 that I gave them initially. Let's move on. The next build that we will be discussing is my build of the Romans. This was not a purely solo endeavor. I, I had a fantastic co-designer named Lorenzo M. Uh, he knows a lot about Roman history. We had a great time working on this together. Uh, and he gave me some fantastic feedback alongside Tyranitar, Armaldo, Desert Monk, and a couple others. So incorporating those ideas, especially seeing some of the Civ's more broken strategy options, here's what we have come to with the Romans. Um, they now are called an elite and infantry build. That levy thing I mentioned earlier, elite is like the opposite of that. I, I like classifying units that cost gold, especially like, you know, um, the knights, the crossbows, the swordsmen line, that sort of thing. I like calling those elite units to kind of distinguish civs that focus on them from civs that focus on trash, namely levy. Their first change is that their spear skirm bonus, the one that made spears and skirms substantially stronger, but replaced part of their cost with gold, um, it had previously made their bonus damage worse. I've removed that entirely. They're still just as good as counter units now. Next, uh, they have a blacksmith bonus that lets blacksmith and all blacksmith techs be available an age earlier and be a little cheaper. Um, now, the blacksmith and infantry technologies are available an age earlier, but the cost reduction is improved. So if you want to use this to bump up your drushes or man-at-arms rushes, it will actually be very impactful and will definitely make that a staple of Roman play. Um, but it won't let you do the broken nonsense that was bodkin arrow archers in feudal age or bracer crossbows in castle age. This should hopefully be a lot more fair and also a lot more recognizable as being a Roman bonus rather than something that will mostly benefit the archer line. Uh, next, their unique unit, the Vexillarius, which is a non-attacking standard bearer, has better defined stats, much like a lot of the other unique units I mentioned earlier. The Romans also now receive bloodlines. Uh, they still don't have a fantastic stable, but it was pointed out to me that the Romans of this era did have decent cavalry, not fantastic, but decent. And the fact that the Romans can get cavalry unique units through their Fidorati unique technology, it just felt very feels bad men if those unique units did not even get bloodlines. So this was a way of throwing them a bone in that regard uh, and giving them a couple more potentially viable options instead of their previously broken archer line. Uh, I also, lastly, updated their likeliometer, and now it stands at exactly a 5 out of 10. Um, I have no idea what the Rome at War DLC will bring us. It might be a Roman civilization for AoE2 proper. I'm completely on the fence on this one, and hence, on the fence sounds like a 5 out of 10 to me. Let's move on, shall we? The next build we'll be looking at is the Umayyads. I would say, of all of the builds I've done on this channel, the Umayyads were the weirdest. Uh, I don't know what it is. You know me at this point. I like to push the boundaries. I like to see what I can get away with. 
The Umayyads bonuses, it felt like almost every single one of them was breaking some sort of unwritten or written rule of the game. Huge thanks to Jason Smith, David DG, Guru Guru, Don Rim, and many others for input. I think this has one of the biggest comment sections of any video I've ever put out because a lot of people had a lot of very strong opinions about this one, and for good reason, I would say. So let's begin with a new Civ Ensign. I'll be honest, when I first made the Civ Ensign for these guys, it was a little bit lazy. I just kind of found the, like, went with the first picture I could find. But I did a little more research. White was a really important color for Umayyad heraldry, especially during their war versus the Abbasids. Uh, and after looking into that, plus a little bit of Islamic iconography of the time, I came to this design. It's a lot more handmade. I think it's a lot prettier. It stands out a lot more. And I think it uses a fairly original color palette. I very much hope that you like it. So they now have that as their Civ Ensign. Moving on. They have a bonus where they would start with a free barracks, but it was pointed out to me that there's a lot of chances that this could really end up being very awkward, like spawning in resources and things like that. The thing that really changed my mind about this one, though, is that someone mentioned that on Nomad, this bonus would really not work. And so I have changed it now to make it so that the first barracks you build within line of sight of your starting town center is free and built instantly. Now, that stipulation is to make sure you can't mega forward your barracks and be cheesy and annoying, but I think that this should still work fairly intuitively and give you the benefit that you'd hopefully want in a way that you have more control over. I love playing with line of sight as a mechanic. It's one of my favorite ways to impose kind of aura style effects, and this is one of the more, I think, intuitive and tame ways of using a line of sight style effect that I think does a pretty good job of bringing necessary balance to this particular bonus. So beyond that, what else do we have? Well, I have made a great many changes to their unique building, the Kandak. If you're not familiar, this would be a stone defense costing gold and stone that would automatically generate you free units. These would cost no resources, not take population, but would be garrisoned inside of the Kandak, and when you release them, they'd have a timed life. So a lot of very new things for Age of Empires too. Um, the changes I made are numerous. Uh, I'll give you a summary now. The Kandak can now not be built till the Castle Age, and it no longer replaces the Outpost. It's a standalone building, kind of like the Kraypost. Uh, I've retuned a ton of numbers, so the building largely functions the same, but just it hits different power spikes at different times and is a little more consistent, a little less fiddly in how it scales. Uh, and it also now costs a little bit less stone to compensate for the fact that it can't be built till castle. It also is in general a little bit less tanky and makes units a little bit slower. Uh, so hopefully it will be a little less bad at just flooding the map out. But the fact that it's just a little bit cheaper should make it such that if you can get a solid castle and establish map control like the Umayyads really want to do, you'll still be rewarded by being able to have a nice stream of weak crappy chaff that you can fling at your opponents. Uh, I want to end this Umayyad section with an open question to you, the audience. Uh, a big topic in the comments section in the previous video was the idea of naming this civilization the Umayyads. Uh, Age of Empires II does not do dynastic civilizations as a rule. Uh, we don't have the Carolingians, we have the Franks. We don't have the Castilians, we have the Spanish. We don't have the Ming, we have the Chinese. And my naming this civilization the Umayyads distinctly breaks this fairly well-established but unspoken tradition. My question to you all is, do you think this is a big deal? Do you think I should change the name from the Umayyads to a name proposed to me by a commenter, the Syrians? The Umayyads were a Syrian family, and their base of power was firmly fixed in Syria during the vast majority of their reign. Don't get me wrong, I think that Syrians is actually a pretty great name and really covers most of the bases I wanted to cover with this particular civilization, even though I did design it around the Umayyads proper rather than the Syrians more specifically. So I really could go either way on this topic. I'm personally more inclined towards Umayyads because I do not find the dynastic naming convention to be an important one to uphold. Yes, I can agree it exists, but I also think that it very well could change. and. If nothing else, this theory crafting series is about uh, pushing the boundaries of what the game currently does. Uh, but even so, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this open question, because it will not only inform my future design choices for the Umayyads, but for theory crafts writ large, because there's a whole lot of dynastic civilizations I could tackle and would have to uh, approach in a different fashion if you guys in the comments really convinced me that going with dynastic naming conventions is not a good idea. That all out of the way, let's move on to the next build we're covering here today. 
that being my second ever unit, the Arcabusier. Um, this video actually is the single best performing video on my channel. It definitely captured people's imaginations. People tend to have strong, strong opinions on gunpowder in Age of Empires, and my build, I think, did a good job of sparking discussion on that, even if it had other shortcomings. So, uh, what have I done to change it? But before we talk about that, thanks to Zasser994, Crown, Divicos Power, and many others for input on this particular build. You guys are great. All of you guys are great. You guys are fantastic. I love my comments section. Let's move on. First thing, I've made the Archibuzier have less HP and attack. Not by a ton, but a little bit. Enough to be noticeable. Uh, it now, however, costs minus 20 gold, bringing it down to 80 gold. Still more than a knight, but not the 100 it was before. It also has slightly better rate of fire and attack delay. So it's a little bit easier to micro the Archibuzier than it was before, but before it was awful. It was like the worst thing you could be trying to micro in the game. So a couple of buffs and nerfs, trying to equalize the Arcabuzier out with a couple of other units that are currently in the game, while still keeping it feeling not entirely homogenous with them, if that makes sense. Next, I've clarified that the corned powder technology also applies to bombard towers. Thanks very much to whichever commenter suggested that particular clarification. I also have made a couple of mild civilizational balance choices, namely that Burgundians no longer have Calivermen, uh, the upgrade to the Archivizier, and the Teutons now get corned powder, uh, which I should remind, applies not only to the Archibuzier, but also to all gunpowder units and buildings like the Bombard Tower. So a couple minor things there. Um, I also have added the civilization availability for my new Jurchens build into their civ availability document. I intend on doing this pretty regularly as I release new civilizations, but I probably won't release those updates until I do other recraft videos like this in future. Uh, I also updated their Likeliometer. It now sits at a 3 out of 10 rather than, I think, the Waffly 3.5 or 4 I had it at before. Um, similarly to the Footmen, I do not think that the Age of Empires team is likely to release any new common units that aren't very regionally specific in future. Um, if they did try to address gunpowder in Age of Empires and make it more diverse than just the hand cannon, I think the Archivizier would be a shoe-in, and I'd increase the Likeliometer rating to like an 8 out of 10. Uh, but I really don't think that's going to happen, so hence my update. Uh, I also wanted to give a clarification on this particular build of the Archivizier. A number of people pointed out that it feels very similar to the hand cannoneer in terms of kind of how it functions and how it shoots and similar. This is entirely intentional. Um, right now, the hand cannoneer is kind of trying to represent both the arquebus and the actual hand cannon as it was fielded on medieval battlefields. And so it kind of takes weird amalgamated elements of both of them. I do intend in future to make a substantial hand cannoneer rework, which will make the unit function very differently, hopefully distinguishing that from this Archibuzier build very substantially. So just know that for now, this Archibuzier build would not be intended to be released alongside the Hand Cannoneer as it exists currently in the game, but as it would exist in this hypothetical rework. A kind of a lame answer. I, I don't mean to use this to say, oh, uh, it's not my fault it sucks because you just haven't seen the end result yet, bro. No, I, I can, it, it, as you can see, there's plenty of shortcomings of this particular build, but its similarities to the hand cannon are at the very least intentional, at least as of now. Moving on to the last of my first 11 builds, the Jurchens. I released this one very recently. You guys seem to really like it. I thought it would be my, my sleekest, most streamlined, like non-controversial build that I ever made. This was not true. Uh, thanks to like a bajillion people for help on this one, Zaster994 penned this like absolutely fucking glorious novel in the comments section and I have saved it to my hard drive because I love it so much. Uh, also thanks to Lorenzo M, Johannes Eolfsson, Jack Opolsky, Riaz Agahi, and many, many others for input on this particular build. Let's get into the changes. There's a lot of them. The civilization is now classed as a Lancer and Cavalry Archer civilization. Um, it was pointed out that, well, yes, they are quite good at Cavalry. They really do focus on the Step Lancer, and we don't have a civilization that really focuses on the Step Lancer yet, so why not call them a Lancer civilization? I liked that idea. I like being specific, uh, and so I have done it. Uh, additionally, I have nerfed slash kind of streamlined their food bonus. A lot of people correctly pointed out that a lot was going on with it. Uh, and while I do still really like the idea, 
of it being kind of stratified based on your age, so I haven't removed that. I have nerfed it uh, and made it a lot clearer what it does. Uh, and now only benefits hunting in Dark Age, only benefits shepherds in Feudal Age, and only benefits farmers in Castle Age, all to 20% effectiveness. Mongol hunters are 40%, so this is a substantial nerf over those. Britain shepherds are 25%, so I think that is, I think they are, they should be. And so that's also a nerf. Um, and sloth farmers are, I think, 10%, so this is a huge buff, but it only applies in Castle Age. So I think that should be a whole lot more fair and still accomplish what I wanted the bonus to accomplish from both a strategy and playstyle and a historical authenticity standpoint. Moving on, uh, I made a big poo-poo with this one. The Burgundians already have a bonus that their stable techs are 50% cheaper. I forgot that existed, and I'm stupid. Thanks for reminding me that that existed, Lorenzo, because I was just blissfully unaware that I had completely fucked that one up. Oops! Uh, moving on, I made a new bonus that I think will work a lot better. Before I get to that, though, I did take their cheaper Feudal Age bonus and move it from a team bonus to a Civ bonus. Um, a lot of people were very concerned about the rush potential that having 33% cheaper Feudal Age as a team bonus might bring. While I liked kind of the theming of it being like unifying the clans and together we can achieve Imperial glory, um, I found another team bonus that I think works quite well. So this moving to a Civ bonus, I think, keeps enough of the kind of historical theming and identity while being a little less controversial. Uh, the new team bonus is that Every first cavalry technology per age costs minus 50% and takes minus 50% time to research. And I should note that this can apply retroactively. So if you research bloodlines in the castle age and haven't researched another feudal age cavalry tech, it will still get this bonus even if you're already in castle age. I should also note that it doesn't just apply to stable technologies. It also applies to the barding armor researches in the blacksmith, because those are cavalry specific, and applies to cavalry archer technologies like the heavy cavalry archer upgrade and Parthi in tactics. There's even historical grounding, because as I mentioned in that video, the Jurchens were really famous for how good their horses were, and they would even sell horses and breed horses for their other Turco-Mongolic neighbors. So this kind of represents that. In some ways, even feels like a more appropriate team bonus than the cheaper feudal age. So hopefully a win-win, unless you guys see something else broken about this one. I am aware that it doesn't really help out the mezzo sieves. Kind of sucks. Couldn't really think of a way around that. Maybe this could benefit the archer armor technologies as well. Not sure about it. What do you guys think? Next, Fortified House. You guys also picked this one apart in the comments section. And I agree. God almighty, this seems like it would be super annoying to deal with as an obnoxious pseudo tower rush thing. So, first big change, it can't shoot till the castle age. And it's worse at shooting overall. Uh, but it's faster to turn a house into a fortified house and it no longer has minimum range. So if you make a house wall of fortified houses and your enemy comes and tries to bash through them, they'll be able to shoot at the enemies that entire time. Um, my goal with the fortified house was not to make it a tower rushing tool, but rather it was to make it a like a, a wall that could fight back, I suppose. Uh, and I think that this change will help it do that a lot more, um, especially because if you make a little wall with them, that should hopefully give you the time to get from feudal to castle to the point where they can start shooting in retaliation. Tell me what you guys think of this one. The Fortified House is something I really love from a historical authenticity point of view, uh, but it definitely wasn't applied brilliantly in the first round, so uh, tell me if you think this one's any better. Next of all, like many other unique units in this batch, the TF Bao was not very well defined, so I went in and I gave it a whole bunch of specific stats. Uh, I also, on suggestion of the mighty Zaster 994, gave it bonus damage versus buildings. A good amount, too. This will allow it to kind of function like a Tarkin, like a very fast building-destroying machine, but unlike the Tarkin, it's ranged. Also unlike the Tarkin, though, it could potentially hurt your own guys if they're in the blast radius, so you got to be careful about that. Um, the Iron Pagoda now also has its upgrade cost reduced, though only kind of, because previously its upgrade cost would have been cheapened by that former 50% off stable tax bonus, so it's technically more expensive now, but cost reduced in name only, shall we say. Cost tweaked, how's that? Um, and the unique technology Guaisama now gives you plus one armor for every two nearby cavalry units within one tile. Uh, this means that you'll only get the full plus four if you really bunch up your guys and do all that lovely 
step lancer stacking nonsense we all hated so much when they first released. On top of all this, I also removed the knight line. Their step lancers kind of fulfill the knight's role already. And I removed the siege onager. It was pointed out to me that them being, you know, cavalry archers, cavalry, and then good siege makes them very similar to the Mongols, even though I think I did a pretty good job of distinguishing them overall. So removing the siege onager should make them feel much more like their own civilization rather than just weird Mongols, which is definitely not what I wanted to achieve. And with that, we are finally done with the Jurchens. Whew, that was a long one. Thanks again for all your input on that particular civilization, guys. Definitely needed the help. And for all the others. But you may notice, if you've seen the, all the videos on my channel about Age of Empires, that there are three builds that I'm leaving off of this list. That being the Lombards, the Wagadugans, and the Swedes. So why haven't I included them in this particular video? Well, I haven't found enough changes to merit a full recraft yet. Um, I've got a lot of great comments on those videos, but none of them have quite sparked me to make any major changes to the civilization designs. I'm working on plenty of changes behind the scenes, especially to the Lombards, which I think are a very clumsy build, albeit very cool. So they won't be included in this particular theory recraft batch. But if you want to see a recraft for any of these civilizations, go to their respective videos and leave some ideas on how you might change them up. I'll, I'll include some links up here for you to follow if you'd like. Um, I think that all of them have plenty of room for improvement, and I would certainly like to hear what you might do to change them. I have no doubt that I'll get plenty of great comments by the time I do another Theory Recraft video, and at that point I'll include any of these three civilizations that have enough new material to merit a change, as well as any of the civs I've already discussed that have also had additional changes since then that might merit a second Recraft. I'd also like to give a special shout out to the commenter Hans, uh, who gave me some excellent suggestions on how to redo my video thumbnails. Um, for those who don't know, I was a professional model and actor for the past several years. I did recently quit when my wife, son, and I moved to a new house, um, but I had all these pictures laying around from my modeling days, and it just felt like, you know, oh yeah, I want to put a picture of myself on my thumbnail. Here, I have a modeling photo. That looks in no way compatible with the subject matter I'm talking about. The thumbnail I used for this video is kind of a first attempt at spicing up that formula. I kind of like it so far. It's not necessarily very medieval looking, but um, we might get to that in time. Uh, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Tell me uh, if, if you happen to have any thoughts on the channel's aesthetic overall and, and thumbnail construction more specifically. That and literally any other suggestions you might have are more than welcome in the comment sections down below. Um, my email is also available in the About section of my channel when you are viewing it on PC. I've heard from a number of you guys already. It's fantastic talking to you all over email. I don't bite. You're more than welcome to reach out anytime you like, and the only time I won't reply is if I'm already deluged with messages. With all that being said, we come to the end of Theory Recraft number one. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this has been entertaining, a little bit different from usual, a little more off the cuff than usual. Um, do you want to contribute to any of these designs? Go and comment on the build videos. I want to hear everything you have to say and more. Comment on this video if you'd like. But regardless of where you choose to comment, I would love to hear your thoughts, and I'd especially like to know what would you like to see from me next? What other civilizations? What other units? What other Age of Empires topics? What other random content? More broadly speaking, I'm up for anything right now. YouTube is a fantastic hobby for me at the moment, and I intend on keeping it that way. But until next time, and there will be a next time, I have another Theorycraft build coming out quite soon. My name is Robbie Howell, and ciao for now.